I'm Dan Rundy. Uh, I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. We're going to be talking about Typhoon Haiyan, lessons learned in effective coordination of international disaster relief. Um, I think uh, we're going to have a very interesting conversation. I'm going to just wait a second while my, my colleagues, uh, the other panelists, come up and join us. Uh, Maria and Praveen, if you guys could just please come up, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Are we going to show a video? Okay, there's not, we're not going to show a video. Okay, good. That's good. I prefer not to show a video. Uh, but let me just, I, I think the thing to take away from uh, Typhoon Haiyan is a terrible natural disaster happened almost six months ago. But oftentimes at these sorts of conversations, there's a bad news story. This is not a bad news story. And certainly there was a terrible tragedy. But out of a terrible tragedy is a good news story. And the good news story is the resilient response of the Philippine government, the effective partnership between the US military and the, the Philippine military, uh, the effective partnership of the UN agencies and the private sector, we're going to talk about that, the effective partnership of UN agencies and donor countries such as the United States government and others. I'm going to list some of the other donor governments. Uh, and the, uh, the fact that uh, the, many things were taken care of in a way swiftly and in a coordinated way, uh, taking advantage of changes in technologies and practice in the disaster response space over the last five, ten years, and some lessons learned in, from other disasters, that many lives were saved and the, the, res, the response to the disaster has been very impressive. So I think this is a good news story. Ultimately, out of the tragedy has come a, a good news story and an optimistic uh, and, and, and a, a lot of room for optimism and hope for the Philippines. Um, I also think, though, that as part of the response, there's been some um, some important, uh, if I can put it this way, uh, this wasn't expected, this wasn't part of the, what was, was going to happen, uh, was expected, but I do think that uh, there have been some unexpected geostrategic uh, outcomes that have come about as a result of the response to Typhoon Haiyan, or as is known as, as Typhoon Yolanda. Um, let me just list the donors um, in terms of government, uh, government contributions to the response. The number one donor to the response of Typhoon Haiyan was the United Kingdom government with $110 million. Very, very significant and in some ways unexpected. Uh, then the United States at $90.9 million. Canada very generously at $63 million. Uh, Japan with $58.9 million, and Australia at 38.7. You notice on this list you don't see the government of China. Uh, the government of China gave, I believe, a grand total of $100,000 and a hospital. I think this is a, a lesson and opportunity for China to think about its public diplomacy and, its, um, and how it's perceived in the region. I will use that as, a, as an editorial comment. Um, but I also think, even though it, the United States has held in very high regard in the Philippines already, and we have a deep and long friendship with the with Philippines. Um, I do suspect that the effectiveness of the U.S. response and partnership through the private sector, as well as through UN agencies, I also think has set the table for the very recent um, part military uh, security partnership agreement that was signed in the last 10 days. I think it created sort of the conditions for a greater acceptance uh, in the Philippines for a deeper security partnership with the United States. As I said, it wasn't. Uh, what, how this was, how this uh, was, wasn't planned, but I do think it's one of the uh, one of the knock-on effects that I think is there in the in the sort of one of the elephants in the room that I think we just need to be aware of. But now let's go to the to the main reason why we're here today and talk about the response, the effectiveness of the response, and the and the good news story that came out of this tragedy. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to each of the panelists. You have their biographies in front of you. But I'm going to ask first uh, uh, Maria Austria, who is the Deputy Chief of Mission for the Embassy of the Republic of the Philippines here in the, here in the United States, um, to kick us off. Maria, the floor is yours. We're moving into a new building. And the good news is we have a new building. The bad news is we're still working out the kinks. So sorry about that, folks. 
Uh, thank you. I'll try to keep my remarks brief and confined to three main areas. What happened and how it affected us? What have we done? And where do we want to go from there? Uh, so for a country used to typhoons and natural disasters, uh, we have an average of 20 every single year. Uh, the typhoon, the typhoon Haiyan was really one for the books and created a humanitarian crisis that would have challenged any government. So 14.1 million people were affected with more than 4.1 million displaced, over 6,000 people killed, and to this day, over 1,700 people remain missing or unaccounted for. Uh, the difficulty is many entire families were lost, so we have difficulty in tracking down exactly uh, who died, who was found, uh, who remained missing because of this difficulty. One very graphic description was it's like a giant fist came down from heaven and pounded the entire area. So there were areas where there were practically no survivors. So the immediate humanitarian effort we launched had to contend with a number of significant challenges. The wide area of destruction scattered over many islands meant great difficulty in getting into the affected areas. This was compounded by lack of transportation, extremely limited or in some places absolutely no communications, and damaged infrastructure. Humanitarian supplies and personnel arrived within days, but we had difficulty in getting them to the more remote areas. So when we did get the supplies into the staging areas, like the bigger islands like Tacloban, we then experienced a problem with capacity. So after a few planes came in, we were already we already were fully booked, the airport was fully booked. So we had to go into creative responses to make sure we are able to distribute the supplies and aid effectively. So at the time, we were very grateful for the help of both of many foreign governments, including the United States government and many NGOs. So from the, from the life-saving early days, we went into more Program, programmatic areas like emergency livelihood. So we implemented cash for work programs, particularly in the area of debris clearing. We, re, we asked the survivors to come in and help clear debris uh, in exchange for cash handouts, which they used for their immediate needs to supplement the aid that was coming in. So we also did clearing and tried to transform the 44 million felled coconut trees into usable coco lumber for temporary shelters. Uh, for the fishermen, we mobilized private sector organizations to try to rebuild boats to be able for them to sustain their livelihood. So six months later, a UN report describes this humanitarian situation as fragile, but stabilized across the affected regions largely because of the humanitarian response coupled with the survivor's remarkable resilience. I think this is a very apt description of what happened to the Philippines and how we managed to get through the immediate phases of the crisis through the Filipino's resilience and the help that poured out from the international community. So the initial response was food and humanitarian efforts, food and humanitarian supplies, and now we are moving on to support for long-term efforts like permanent shelter, uh, long-term employment for the displaced people, education, and, and uh, the auxiliary services. So in December, the Philippine government launched a, what we call the Ray Plan, or the uh, Rehabilitation Assistance for Yolanda. So this, the president also appointed a presidential assistant for rehabilitation and recovery, who in turn formed cluster groups to address the different sectors, such as infrastructure, resettlement, livelihood, social services, and support services. So the Philippine government is very much aware that Haiyan may just may be just the beginning of more storms due to more destructive storms due to climate change, storms that we have not seen before. And we are particularly concerned at this point because by next month, uh, the typhoon season will start and it will go on for like the next five months or so. So we are very anxious to make sure that the communities, specifically the vulnerable position, uh, populations are secured to make sure they're able to handle whatever comes next. So at the backbone of the Philippine government's program is the philosophy of building back better. And this will involve uh, several components. Uh, for one, uh, we are trying to build 200,000 housing units to resettle the displaced population. We now have over 180,000 in the pipeline. Uh, 
but there's still a gap. In terms of education, we have 5,333 classrooms committed out of the 18,000 classrooms that need to be repaired or rebuilt. In terms of livelihood, uh, we have distributed materials for 12,000 fishing boats, but at the same time, we are also exploring ways to ensure that we build back better and have more sustainable employment opportunities for others. One of the ideas we have been exploring is that of getting a special trade preference from the U.S. government to attract manufacturing industries to resettle in the areas affected by Yolanda. So we're making, we are proposing a short, uh, limited time trade preference program for products coming out of the areas affected by Yolanda. So the challenges that confront the Philippines are lack of available land for housing units. We need over 2,000 to build over 2,000 housing units, but we have only 26,000 lots available. Uh, one factor that complicates this is the fact that by building back better, we want to make sure that our people build away from the shoreline. So an initial idea was to have no build zones, but that is a major political and practical concern. If you have, because you cannot put back like 200,000 people into an area that can only accommodate 20,000. So we will have to embark first on a comprehensive hazard mapping exercise, which will determine which zones should be absolutely no build, which zones will be safe, and which zones will be controlled zones. So we're, we're ve working very closely with our local government units to make sure that we are able to determine safe zones in a practical and practicable manner. So at this point, the Philippine government is working out a master plan for reconstruction and rehabilitation, con uh, consolidating inputs from local government units. We hope to be able to unveil the master plan by June. So with that, uh, I look forward to a productive discussion uh, with our colleagues from the private sector and the U.S. government and NGOs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Austria. Thank you very much. Praveen, you're the representative and country director for the UN World Food Program. You were on the ground and we had a very interesting discussion before this panel over lunch. And it's quite clear you, you have a, a very uh, uh, detailed understanding of what's going on and, and the World Food Program has had a very uh, complete response to this emergency. Thank you, Dan, and uh, good afternoon. First, uh, the, the, the reason we're all together here today is to talk about coordination. And for coordination to really work, I think no place better than the Philippines. They actually have a word. It's called baninihan. And this is so far entrenched in their way of being that it made our life so much easier. It is the concept of sharing. It is not the concept of an immaterial or, or materialism. This is mine. This is yours. It's everybody pulling in together to work for a common goal. And um, I pay tribute to the government of the Philippines and its people. Uh, they actually have a concept, which is called Bani um, Having said that, let me just uh, tell you why this coordination was so important. It saved lives. We, the already the tragedy of having lost so many lives due to the crisis, to the typhoon, and the storm surge that, fo that followed, um, it's really, really incredible that the damages and loss of life is not much larger. But as together as an international community, we really came together, and what we did was save lives as the first and primordial uh, result of this coordination. Um, originally, I had proposed a, a video just to show you a very quick synopsis of what that damage was. But if you think of it very quickly in a, in a mind, um, the Philippines has 7,106 islands. Okay? This is an incredible number of islands, if you can just picture that in your mind and say across from north to south, and then draw like a, a highlighter through the middle, um, that's where that would be the path of the, uh, the typhoon. Hitting an incredible vast array of people, 14 million people as you heard Maria say, four million were displaced. But due to this coordination and the partnerships that we have 
with the U.S. government, with the private sector, with NGOs, with the private individuals, we were able to reach three million people right off the bat. And when I say right off the bat, I literally mean starting from day one. The flexibility and the generosity shown to us uh, and the Filipino people by, all, by everybody being there and working for that common goal was in the way they made themselves available and the sorts of tools that they made available. And as the World Food Program, people must be thinking we're only food. Well, you're 90% correct. Um, how do you attend three million people? Where's the food? And you need the sort of flexibility to be able to buy it, to get it locally, to move it, to store it, to make sure it gets to the right people at the right time and in the right place in the right quantity. It makes no use to hand out a little bit and then you need to do it a hundred times. It's just impractical with the sort of extent and damage. And that's where coordination, and that's where the concept of Bani Nihan, and that's where the concept of the cluster approach of the United Nations um, systems comes into place where specialized agencies are doing specialized work. And, uh, and, and the World Food Program led the cluster. We call them clusters as well, as, as Maria mentioned, the government. Uh, on the logistic cluster is, is, a, is an area that lead, is led by the World Food Program. It, it takes care of all the logistical the actual physical um, movement of food and uh, storage of food and non-food items that may be required. Now, when we talk about movement and you think of the damage that happened, uh, one of our greatest partners was the civil military support. And that from day one was there. It was there for a very, big, for a very short time, but it enabled us to quickly come together and set up the the mechanisms that would be needed. And in this regard, I'd like to put on record and thank the U.S. government uh, specifically. Uh, when we first landed, I landed there on the very first day, the morning after at 7 o'clock in the morning, there was no airport. And may, while many people may think, well, plane, you know, the military can usually land, what happens when it goes dark? You can't see it. There was no lights. There was no ways. There was no... Uh, fuel to make the planes fly. So with that sort of augmented capacity that was made available, this partnership became intrinsic and extremely valuable. Uh, in the very first days, you can, I talked about the 7,000 Island, to get out to the, to the locations in a place that has lost, as you heard from Maria, boats. So how do you go? we were able to, with the support, get out to these remote islands. So this civil military support that was provided was a real godsend in making sure that the people received the benefits and the relief assistance that was needed. This was a learning lesson for us. Um, we were doing three things at the same time, which we had never done before, which is response, relief, and then recovery. People normally think you do the response, then you move to the relief, and then you move to recovery. Well, here we were doing it from day one. The extent of the typhoon was so large that where it made landfall, we were doing response. In the middle, we were almost moving into relief, and in the far west, we could already start thinking about recovery uh, from day one. Put in the, the wheels into place that would enable us to do so. To do this as, as a group, most of the coordination was happening on the ground on a daily basis at 7 o'clock in the evening. And why am I so specific? Because at 7 o'clock in the evening, even humanitarians need to take a break. And so they would do so by getting all together and talking about what needed to be done. And that coordination wasn't in some high-flying high, uh, skyscraper in Manila. It was on the ground in the very location that was made available so that everybody came together and they said, this is what we're seeing, this is what is happening. Communication, totally blacked out. There was no communication. With our process and working with everybody, the private sector uh, and companies like Ericsson, um, we set up telecommunication system that enabled not only voice but data. So there was a sharing of information immediately. 
uh, that would be made available to all. And what I'd like to say is that when you are, when you are in this situation, it seems, and it would be in most situations, but in the Philippines, it seemed that everybody naturally fell into place. And it, that was because they were so specialized in everything that they did. The people that came, the surge capacity, I can talk about the World Food Program, my office under the best of circumstances, about 100 people. For this particular crisis, we surged by 300 people. So we had 200 people flying in, and we contracted 100 people uh, locally. So in order to, to build up and to have that capacity, it requires a, a real knowledge about what's needed, when is it needed, and where is it needed, and what is that expertise. And because of this coordination, we were able to very quickly come to say, okay, we need so many nutritionists, we need so many logisticians, we need so many uh, um, field monitors to go out and monitor and make sure that the, the assistance is getting out to the people that need to receive it. Um, and this was possible because of this coordination. And, and I'd like to say that none of this would have been possible or it would have been a lot more difficult had we not had the backbone structure that the government provided. The government of the Philippines was there in every step of the way. Um, we were able to piggyback, strengthen um, what was already being done. I think, Dan, you mentioned very importantly the debris cleaning and, 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 the, and the use of the forces. But really, I can tell you, from the airport to the city of Tacloban, is a distance of maybe five, 10, 15, 20 minutes maximum. It would have taken you five hours on that first day. Yeah. We were shipped by helicopter. So none of that, but the two days later, you did it in the 15 minutes. Roads were cleared. And that's what the civil military provided in that coordination so that we could move relief goods and make it available. Um, as we are now six months later, is it over? Is it done? Can we all say we did a great job, now we need to slowly wind down and move away? I think some of the more serious work will now begin. We did save lives. It's no longer, and I think you heard it from Maria and you heard it from Dan, the Philippines goes through about 30 typhoons a year. Last year, we were at Yolanda. Why? In the alphabet. So it's no longer a question of if, it's a question of when. It's a question of how strong will it be? How many people will be affected? So we need to uh, lay the foundation for moving into livelihoods and early recovery. And that is the stage that we as Wolfo program and the international community is currently at. It's moving to this next phase and saying, what is it that needs to be done and how can we do equally a good job together to address those needs? And it is a question of scaling up, but scaling up into newer areas, into newer needs. Um, and we, I just want to say that with the government as the backbone, we were able to reach 500,000 people in the month of February with cash. As markets came online, we were able to use the very important resources provided by our donor community in a very strategic manner, making sure that the people that needed to receive it got it. And we did that through the government of 500,000. We did that through the NGO community where we reached an additional 85,000 people. So in total, almost 700,000 people got cash as we transited from food to other resources, the flexibility of the international community. And I would be remiss if I, if I didn't highlight the role of the private sector. The private sector was crucial. Wolf Food Program, and I'd like to be sort of unbashful if you allow me, is to think, we think we're incredible. 
we think we know it all. We think, hey, if there's an emergency, we're there and we can do it. But uh, Larry, I'm really proud that the Wolf Food Program has a partnership with companies as solid as UPS. That when they came in and did what they do, you sort of sat back and said, wow, here we can really learn something. And that sort of partnership and that sort of thing from the private sector, bringing in that expertise. Um, and just for anybody else, but I feel very proud about it. As Wolf Food Program, I don't know another country that has received so much assistance from the private sector to be the second largest contributor to the Typhoon Yolanda. Amongst all the countries that came to our support, but the private sector in its totality represented almost the second largest donor. To, to the World Food Program. To the World Food Program in Yolanda. In Yolanda. I'd, I'd like, and I think that speaks highly of the, of the Philippine people. I think it speaks very highly of the private sector, that this was not something that they were willing to stand back to. And I'd like to think that has a lot to do with Bani Nihan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry Darrow, you've flown in from uh, Atlanta to be with us. Thanks for being with us. You're the president of Global Business Services for UPS. Uh, you have a deep strategic relationship since 2009 with the World Food Program. Talk a little bit about that and talk sure. about your, your contribution to the response uh, to Hurricane Yolanda, or Typhoon Yolanda. The uh, success between uh, UPS and the World Food Program is really about having shared values to uh, support humanitarian uh, needs and relief. And their ability to leverage UPS as a World Food Program with the need for logistics expertise. So our relationship um, began in 2009 and has deepened year over year, um, not only from a financial contribution, but also from uh, engagement and expertise and engagement of our employees, whether uh, up at the top of UPS or down on the ground um, in the areas such as the Philippines with community service to support disaster relief. Um, the value I think that um, uh, I challenge other um, private organizations with is the value of the relationship between the nonprofit and leveraging the expertise within a company, not just the financial source, but also the expertise. So in our case, um, we were able to provide support from resources on the ground. Um, we had managers who were trained as uh, logistics emergency uh, team members that were trained in health and also in um, uh, disaster relief that were put into position that helped facilitate the supply chain of moving the goods for relief from uh, different locations through um, the network into uh, Leyte. And our manager not only uh, managed the equipment of warehouses and equipment of trucks uh, and the movement, but also um, managing the inventory. And, and developing a systematic process that um, avoids spoilage by moving product out based off the timeliness of the um, expiration. So uh, the resources uh, that are trained are, I think, vital to emergency situations. And um, some of our staff were asked specifically by name because of their experience in previous disasters. So. The success of um, a partnership, I think, really comes down to leveraging the expertise and having resources at all levels throughout the world uh, that can help support in times of crisis. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. J Jeremy, uh, you are the, you, you come from, of course, from Mercy Corps, but you're now at the U.S. government and you are the Director of Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. Uh, can you talk about talk about the U.S. response to um, ty the typhoon. Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to try and just um, convey a couple of the big takeaways and then happy to dive into these in more um, gruesome detail during the, uh, the Q&A. But, um, you know, I think we, we do look back on the, 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 the initial humanitarian response and relief response as, as, as a pretty good success. I think we, um, we got in very quickly. 
uh, both we, the USG, and we, the, the, the larger international response uh, infrastructure. Um, there was fantastic partnership with the government of the Philippines and great leadership from the government of the Philippines. Um, and uh, very quickly moved what was a, a quite precarious and logistically difficult situation. Is this working? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, uh, into, into a situation that uh, where the, the major humanitarian indicators got stabilized very, very quickly. Uh, we got the population out of an acute kind of acute risk phase very, very quickly, and we're able to move pretty swiftly into more of a, a recovery and transformation posture. And a few things that I think were key to that. One was that some of the disaster risk reduction investments that the U.S. government and the Philippines government had been making for years uh, paid off. And um, the, the, as, as was said earlier, the, the Philippines gets hit many, many times a year by various kinds of disasters, be it, uh, you know, uh, floods, uh, typhoons, earthquakes, you name it. Um, so this is, this is a country that knows how to handle disasters, it, uh, and, but also a country that has made some strategic investments in uh, preparing for and mitigating those disasters. And so uh, before this typhoon hit, there was a, a lot of aid goods got prepositioned in some of the areas that were in the path of the storm, and that enabled the communities who were affected, who are always the first responders in any crisis. Um, you know, we sort of tend to focus on the international community um, or on the military or whomever, but it's always the communities themselves who are the first responders. By prepositioning some of those supplies, um, as well as uh, uh, having shelters in place and so on, it enabled those communities to play that first responder role more effectively and to meet some of those initial needs right up front. Um, so that, that was an effective piece. It also meant that we had more of a platform to build from because that there was an ongoing partnership. It wasn't suddenly the whole international community shows up and has to figure out how to work with the government of the Philippines. No, we had had a partnership. Um, in, in the case of USAID working heavily with, with, with World Food Program, for years on disaster risk reduction programming, which then gave us a great platform to build off of for the response. Uh, the second piece I'd identify as, as, as why this was a fairly successful response, I think on the USG side, we were much better coordinated than we have been in, in some past responses. <clears throat> so if you look at the Haiti response a few years ago, um, which you know, was, was effective on a lot of levels but also faced a lot of challenges, one of, the, one of the challenges was while we were trying to apply a whole of government methodology there, we didn't really have the structures and tools and arrangements fully in place that we needed to do that within the U.S. government. And so what, what was intended to be a process of pulling together a lot of different capacities in a coherent way ended up being a lot of different capacities being pushed into a response in, in a fashion that was not always that well coordinated um, or, or uh, you know, effectively, uh, effectively organized. So we've learned from that. And so in the several years since the, the, the Haiti earthquake, both my office, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, which has the lead coordinator role, uh, but also other parts of the USG have invested in building more of a coordination infrastructure inside the government for this kind of a, re of, of a response. So we don't then find ourselves in a situation where people in Washington are saying, hey, there's a disaster, what can we send out there? But rather, there is mu it, it's mu much more of a, a demand signal oriented arrangement with uh, kind of a clear traffic cop and USAID in the role of that traffic cop. Um, and so what we saw in this, in, this, uh, in this response, a lot of, again, a lot of interest across the US government, but much, people being much more attuned to what, is, what are we hearing from the field in terms of what is needed? Um, how do we coordinate that so it's sent out in a way that is effective and is responsive and is driven by needs and demand signal um, as opposed to projections on this end of what we think might be needed, which is, which is best practice, and we now have an infrastructure in place to make that work. And so on the USG side, we were much better coordinated at Washington level than I think we had, than we have been in some past responses. At field level as well, we were much better coordinated, and particularly on the, the, the civil military piece. Um, 
uh, USAID OFDA has been investing for, for several years now, actually for longer than that, but particularly ramped up the investments for the past several years in being able to partner effectively with the military. And so we have, uh, we have some of our humanitarian advisors placed at each of the combatant commands. We do hundreds of trainings per year now for, uh, for military officers on how to work with us in a disaster response, basics of disaster response, what appropriate roles are, how the system works, and that has just been a huge, huge value add so that we don't, again, sort of the same notion that we don't want the first time we're meeting to be when we're on the runway in Tacloban figuring out how do, we, how do we work together. So in this case, the Marines that they pulled down from Okinawa had actually just been through an exercise with USAID off the staff on a disaster response scenario. So they got in there, they knew just what to do. Uh, General Paul Kennedy, who was a fantastic guy, did a great job knew exactly how to knew exactly how to, to plug in and was there very much and very um, very intentionally in a support role to USAID. Um, and that was written right into their orders actually. The, the 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 request for assistance that went from Secretary Kerry over to Secretary Hagel to officially request the assistance from DOD actually stated we request that DOD be in a support role to USAID OFTA uh, who will be the lead coordinator. And the military found that that worked extremely well and uh, also got them out of there pretty quickly because it set real parameters around what, what did we need from them? What value did, what, what role did they have? How could they add that value? And it laid that out very, very clearly through systems that we've been working with them on for years um, and, and re refining for years. And it meant that within a month they were back out of there again because they had played their role. They got, they got us over the logistical hump in those early days. And I really do think that without the U.S. military role, the whole response at large probably would have been at least a week behind where it was, just because the military got in there so fast and cleared the logistical hurdles so quickly. Um, and then they were able to get back out again. And that was something that is also pretty popular when, uh, on the military side when they can get the job done quickly. So, and they, they saw how these systems helped in that. So on the USG side, at all levels, we started, we kind of got out of our own way more than we have in past responses. Um, another thing I'd point out, just to pick up a little bit on what Praveen said, I think on the UN side, we're starting to see good proof of concept on some of the UN reforms as well. Um, the UN also learned a lot from Haiti and, and from some of the, the challenges encountered there. And they've put in place a number of different reforms, but probably the most important for this is what they call the L3 response, so level three. When they hit a level three response, that gives the UN carte blanche to do a lot of things that they can't normally do in terms of uh, changing out staff, surging in staff, um, it, it triggers certain funding mechanisms, and this was, this was the first fast onset when that, where that was in place, and we saw it put used to, to I think, really great effect, uh, and that helped to enable a much more appropriate, much swifter, better staffed, better resourced response. Um, and then Dan, Dan asked me to also just say a couple words about <laughs> NGOs in the private sector. Um, uh, you know, on the, I think that the, the private sector piece, Praveen and, and, and Larry have, have covered it fairly well. You know, the, 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 the logistical capacity of the private sector, particularly a company like, like UPS, is pretty, pretty remarkable in a response like this and has a lot of value to add. And Larry was talking at lunch earlier about some of the ways in which the expertise that a company like UPS has in, in the Philippines or in any, you know, country, because they, they're, they're there before. You know, they're, they're not showing up for this response, can be used to enable the whole response at large, smoothing the way, helping, helping groups that are newer to understand kind of the systems they're working in. But another thing I think is really important is how, that, how, the, how the private sector has a role to play in the transition to recovery and transformation. Uh, so the, um, there is a really major challenge coming up, while well, we're in it, it's not coming up, on, okay, so, we got the, si the situation stabilized in those first few months, but there is a long-term structural challenge here. There are people living in zones where, as, as Maria said, it, it, these are not safe places to build and to live. Um, there is huge damage, uh, the, the, the destruction of all the coconut trees, which was millions and millions of trees, which was the principal livelihood source in these areas. Um, so there are some pretty major logistical policy and economic challenges that are going to endure for, for years as the country and these parts of, these parts of the, the country in particular adapt to this, this new post-storm reality. Um, USAID has partnered with, uh, with uh, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, other companies to, to work on 
restarting ec uh, productive economic sectors in these areas, restarting, uh, restarting businesses, giving people opportunities to, alter, to, to have new livelihood options um, for those who, uh, you know, who might have been more dependent on coconut production before. Um, it's, a, it's a critical, critical role for the private sector. Um, and we're also seeing a, you know, some challenges on the private sector front. One of the things that we, that we would like to do would be to enable people to build back with higher quality construction materials. We're finding it's hard to source those because they're not produced um, in anywhere near the, 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 the quantities and volumes that are needed. And so you know, the, getting an understanding of how the, you know, which parts of both the international or the, the, you know, the Filipino private sector um, are working well, but also where the gaps are is important to understanding in the much longer term um, what are the what are the not just government, not just NGO, not just UN, but also private and economic capacities that this country is going to need in order to be able to be more resilient against these disasters in the future because they are on the upswing. Um, so I'll I'll leave it there, but happy to talk more about that. So let me start question for you, Jeremy, first, which is we we talked a little bit at lunch about what's what's different say five or ten years ago. Um, I wanted to push on this issue of monetization and cash mm -hmm. and some of these innovations. Yeah. And could you also talk about the role of technology that, say, different, say, five or ten yeah, years ago? Sure. Well, you know, one of the, on the technology front, the the ability to predict and anticipate these storms has just gotten much, much better. So, um, you know, we have a, again, kind of a whole government thing. We have a, a USG, um, uh, we have a USGS uh, expert who works in our office on hydromet disasters and. Um, helps us to anticipate and predict which way these things is, are going to work out. Is that new? Uh, that, that's something we've had for a few years. Um, the technology is getting much yeah. better. Um, the ability to predict is getting yeah. better and better. And, um, and so that's, that's very helpful. Uh, we, you know, technology and the, te the role of technology in aid is always iterative. So one of the things that we tried that didn't, frankly, work that well during this storm was seeing if we could do satellite-based imagery analysis of damage. Um, through a crowdsourcing platform, which is a really cool idea. You kind of send it out to the cloud. There are a lot of tech geeks out there who look at this stuff and can identify. We found that actually it didn't work that well. There that, aren't that many people in pajamas and garages there, doing this? There were plenty of people, or? but, they, but what they, what they, the, the crowdsourcing, uh, basically the, the analysis, did, it was not that effective. And now that's something to learn from. And we, but it's also good to experiment because you can you can kind of figure out what works and what doesn't. And there's you know you always have like 50 failed light bulbs before I, one works. You know, I, I I take your point. I, I I thought what was interesting and encouraging yeah. in the lunch conversation was you've gotten some additional authorities to yes. make cash grants. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm sort of getting at indirectly this issue of is there something around the food monetization yeah. thing? Yeah. Does that help you guys in yeah, something me, like this? Let me speak to that. Um, the uh, USAID has gotten a number of new authorities, new funding streams around food assistance in the past few years. And that has enabled a much more effective response. And we, the way we were able to, so in it, if you go back 10 years, the main tool that USAID would have had would be commodity food. And so there, are, we would have had that. That basically just becomes a logistics exercise of how fast and how much of that food can we get into the zone. But generally, you would it would take weeks, if not months, because you'd have to ship it from somewhere else or divert a ship that was already on the water, and it would just take months. In this case, because we have new cash authorities uh, and we're less reliant just on commodity to meet to meet food needs, we were able to drop some cash right away into WFP to enable them to procure high energy biscuits and other other immediate foods that could be taken right away to the communities and make a difference literally within a few days of this storm hitting. We were then able to, to drop cash in as well for, for a lot much larger volume local procurement of rice there within the Philippines that could get to the zone within uh, a couple of weeks and then last until our large scale bulk commodities were able to come off the water a couple of months later. So by having these tools, we could have a much more continuous stream of support appropriate to the context at the time as opposed to just having one t tool that we try to shoehorn regard in regardless of the situation. Yeah, when I was in the Bush administration, I uh, was asked to help lead the, res the private sector partnerships uh, as uh, in response to the, 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 the Indonesia uh, tsunami as well as the, um, the, the Pakistan earthquake. And we had limited tools, and it was just there was, in my sense, there was a before and after in terms of the private sector response to the tsunami as well as Hurricane Katrina. And so, Larry, I'm thinking that. Um, 
there's been a real evolution and sophistication among companies. I mean, UPS has always been very sophisticated about this, and obviously take, you guys take your time in, in picking partners, and you must have taken a long time in finding WFP as a partner. But could you talk a little bit about how, de, how UPS thinks about emergency responses beyond its partnership with, with WFPA, but B, could you talk a little bit about when you talk to other companies how they're thinking about emergency response? Because I suspect you're not the, I know many of your peer competitors, but not just in your sector, but other industries have become far more sophisticated in the last 10 years about responding to emergencies because the, they have to. So I think there's a couple areas. First of all, um, Speed of decision um, is important in time of crisis, and having a, a master operating plan that how we can support and implement and how that can be executed, um, whether it's resources, whether it's uh, financial support through grants, or whether it's um, through emergency response teams that are trained in that specific area that are working toward a plan. And then after the relief, actually um, editing and, and post-crisis analysis to make that plan better for the future. But the use of technology, uh, if you think about the needs that an organization like the, the World Food Program has as far as the movement of food um, throughout the world and food products, and our expertise as, as a leader in the world for logistics and the use of our technology, it's just like shipping a package. It's the movement of a package, it's the use of technology. And I mentioned the technology earlier that um, we have um, given grants to organizations to help develop that will help better manage the food inventories of, of um, areas of crisis and warehouses, uh, along with um, identification of refugees. So um, when they are given um, their food rations. So technology uh, that's related to the day-to-day -day business of transportation can be applied to nonprofit organizations like the World Food Program for disaster relief. So I, I'm so impressed with UPS. I was talking to you about it earlier. And I think oftentimes people don't realize how large of a company you are. How many, how many countries are you operating in? We have... Um, uh, service in uh, 200 countries and territories, and we've got 395,000 employees throughout the world. So just just bear with me as I ask some leading questions here. But how many <laughs> how many employees uh, do you have in the Philippines? Uh, we have 1,900 employees. Okay, compared to 100 for the World Food Program, right? And how many sh packages do you deliver every day around the world? I bet it's over a million. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or close to it. It's, it's over 13 million. Okay, so you <laughs> deliver 13 million packages every day. So think about the logistical operations that requires internationally to deliver 13 million packages. So I would suspect they have something to teach us about uh, complicated logistics. That's just, just a guess. Um, the, um, and then the, in terms of, just let me just get a little bit further on this issue of it's not, it's oftentimes it's about the technology and expertise that you all bring. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Would you call them LETs? What, uh, what is an LET? Well, it's the um, logistics emergency teams that um, are developed uh, to support um, the UN crisis needs from four organizations which happen to be competitors um, Agility, uh, Maersk, uh, TNT, and UPS. And there's a hundred staff that are trained for um, emergency relief and, and health um, services. And 30 of those staff are from UPS uh, that we do deploy uh, based off of emergency needs. Two of them that we deployed to the Philippines, um, one with the World Food Program, the other with the Salvation Army. Uh, and basically, we're utilizing our expertise and um, the movement of uh, goods and services, but customs clearance, which many people don't think about uh, behind the scenes that happen, and the importance if the product can't get through customs and cleared to the destination, it's going to sit, then you have issues such as timeliness and, and spoilage it, that you have to worry about. Thank you very much. Um, Praveen, can you just talk a little bit about, and I want to also hear from Jeremy and from Maria about this issue of NGO coordination. I think. We talked a little bit about it beforehand that there was, um, it, it, it seems as if there was a market improvement in the Philippines case compared to say other cases I could, I could name where that may not have been so successful. Can you talk a little bit about, you, you, you all work with all sorts of NGOs, but I'd like to hear your take on why that specifically worked, how, you, how coordination with NGOs worked. I'd like to hear from Maria a little bit from the, the Philippine government perspective, and then I'd like to hear from Jeremy about that. 
Thank you, Dan. Um, the NGOs play a, a crucial role. Um, and as, you, as all of us have said, this is not the first time in the Philippines that we're facing a crisis. World Food Program itself has a, a substantially large program in the Philippines, apart from uh, the response to disasters such as Yolanda. Um, we work mostly in Mindanao, and we have a pre-existing partnership with a, lot, a good many um, large international NGOs like Samaritan's Purse, uh, Plan International, uh, World Vision. So it, there is a, an inbuilt capacity and knowledge about what are the common objectives and visions and how we work together. So um, all of this, because of our regular program of work, which already involves a very strong partnership um, with the NGO community, we have been uh, actually preparing. It's, it's, all, it's all part of preparation. When, you, when you're already doing these in already normally trying conditions and you have a situation like this, it goes without saying that you don't have to wait uh, huge amounts of time as to what it should an agreement look like, what can they do, can they not do, how will it work, will it not work, do you have all the things that our famous auditors uh, will accept at the end of the day, no, this isn't a receipt, but this is and that. So uh, all of those things um, happily are washed away. And we have, and, and, and the most important, and I think, uh, I hope I don't get into trouble for saying this, but one of the greatest things I found coming out of Yolanda, we literally could pick up an NGO and say, yes, just go and do it. And we worried about the agreement further on. And uh, because, a prop the need was so because the need was so great. And they knew exactly what needed to be done. <laughs> and we knew exactly where they were coming from. And we already but, had But people this. weren't running around willy-nilly. And it wasn't no, 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 because no, it was, it the need was so great. The need was so great. And, and everybody knew. And as I said, there was a, a pre-established uh, pre coordination system. Okay. And a very strong partnership. I mean, they didn't come and ask us for something that they were asking somebody else. Okay. Yeah, so and let me, ask, let me ask Maria this question. So I, I can think of other, my sense is that you know, the Philippines has very, you know, it, it's a very capable and successful gov uh, country and it's a very uh, resilient society and has a lot of experience with disasters and so maybe that is part of it. But I, I, I talk a little bit about how the Philippine government thought about the response and how it thought about the role of NGOs in, in the response. Uh, thank you, Dan. As both, as all the other panelists have said, coordination was key, especially in the earliest days when there were no systems that uh, we could bank on. At the outset, the Philippine government tried to complement, tried to help NGOs do their work by establishing such mechanisms as we had one-stop centers, yep. one-stop shops at the airport, at the ports, which facilitated clearing for customs purposes, for movements of logistics. Uh, more practically all Philippine government agencies also established shop in Cebu and in Tacloban, closest to the areas of disaster, uh, to facilitate work among the NGOs. We, in the Department of Foreign Affairs, we established also a 24-7 office to facilitate offers of assistance from uh, foreign government partners and NGOs. And we had this office set up for more than a month until we were able to establish a more permanent structure. So. What happened was people came in and say, we're willing to do that. And we said, OK, can you go here and do what you're good at doing? And they went. So at one point, we have cross-cutting networks of like some NGOs would adopt a particular locality or municipality. Some, sec some NGOs would adopt a, per a particular need. Like for, there was a time when it struck me as very strange. But there was one NGO who said, we have uh, electric sauce. And I'm like. Okay, and apparently it fit a particular need. And with proper coordination, we had a whole gang of people with electric sauce going to the areas to help in the clearing operations. So that kind of coordination across, gov across different agencies of government, across NGOs, and across foreign governments, particularly helpful in saving lives and facilitating the recovery effort. Jeremy, you, how, how do you all think about this issue of NGO coordination? I know it's an ongoing challenge and opportunity for the, for the United States in, in these sorts of emergencies, but it seems as if it sort of, it sort of worked, it seems as if it would have worked in this case. 
Yeah, I think it did work better in, in this case than it has in some other major disasters. Uh, and I think there are a few factors in that. And I don't want to I don't want to be too Pollyannish. I mean, I think, you know, in any in any instance like this, there is a lot of chaos. There is there, and, and you do get a lot of you get a lot of well established NGOs. You also get a lot of um, NGOs that, that have more, let's say, more um, more goodwill than expertise. Let's say, um, uh, and um, and so you know, I don't think that that the mix of who showed up was necessarily hugely different than it was in others. But I think that a few factors kind of helped us in this one. Um, one was that the, the the coordination infrastructure is more is more mature. The, 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 the coordination architecture is more mature now than it was, uh, say, four or five years ago. And so there have been a number of reforms that I referenced earlier that the UN has been taking in terms of how we coordinate in instances like this. And we just have a better architecture in place for that than we than we used to have. Um, th that gets better staffed now. Um, you know the UN agencies who lead these who lead these coordination mechanisms um, see that as a principal focus, as opposed to a sort of annoying second or third task for um, you know for for a mid-level staffer, which is how it used to be you know, how it used to be run. Um, uh, second factor I'd, I'd say in that is that that we you know there was a, a strong and capable government um, and and a, a tight coordination tight alignment between the UN agencies and the government the government was very involved and very engaged on coordination and when you have that that helps everyone else to kind of find their niche and fall in line when you don't have that that's a huge missing piece um, and that was one of the big challenges in Haiti was that the government had been hit as bad, you know, as badly as anyone else, and couldn't step up and play that role in the way that the Philippines government was able to in this case. And the third, I think, partly it was easier just because of geography. Um, and I think again, the comparison to Haiti is instructive. Haiti, the, the 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 NGO chaos got a lot of press. The 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 disaster in Haiti was very very concentrated. And so you had everyone tripping over themselves because everyone was tripping over themselves. They, they were all trying to respond in the exact same place um, through a very narrow straw. Um, here, the, the nature of the disaster and the geography of the disaster was spread very widely over, uh, I don't know, hundreds, let's say, of, of islands um, and across a really wide area. So if you were an NGO coming in, it wasn't that hard to go and find an area that no one else was working in but which needed assistance and focus on that. And so the, the geography of the disaster just lent itself to a much, frankly, easier coordination challenge. Okay, Maria, so I, there's been a sig significant progress since the typhoon. I know there are some things that the Philippine government would like to see happen in terms of policies. What can your friends, such as the United States, do to be helpful to the Philippine Philippines right now in terms of are there certain policies in Washington you'd like to see happen that that we, that could be helpful to the Philippines right now? Uh, there are a couple of things. For one, we greatly appreciated the passage in early April of a bill in Congress which allowed people to make tax-free donations uh, to the Typhoon Haiyan effort. So that was very helpful. Uh, for one, we also have been trying to get people to get to build more industries rather than uh, have people in the affected areas rely on agriculture. So we've been pushing for a trade preference arrangement, which will allow the duty-free entry into the U.S. of certain products from the affected areas. This will be a time-bound thing, but will be extremely helpful in getting manufacturing industries uh, get a foothold into these uh, areas. Uh, there are also other types of assistance we will need, like we will be embarking on a major uh, geohazard hazard mapping exercise, and technical assistance from the U.S. will be very much appreciated in that area. Great. I think we'll open it up now for some, some Q&A. I know there's some very thoughtful people in the room. This woman back here, uh, this woman here. I also want to hear from my friend Mike Hess as well. So these, these three people. Go ahead. We're gonna do, we'll bunch it together. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Annie Kayaban Wilderman, and I'm retiring from the Navy. I have been very fortunate to have been educated by the government, both in high school and in college, and education from the U.S. Navy. So my passion to promote engagement through the government is uh, unfettered. And um, I would like to ask, because I'm trying to respond to USAID's call for five-page concept papers, and I would assume that the appendices would require some data. Take note, I've been away from the Philippines for 25 years. 
although I have been in 1981, and before I left, I was educated by USAID. So your specific that, question. Yeah. You, you My specific question is, is the panel going to be willing to share the data? Because whatever project we try to, I try to conceptualize should be consistent with what the Philippine government should be doing. And okay. so that okay. I don't have to vet very other good. data we get. Thank you very much. This woman, this woman up here. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Veronica Martin. I've just returned from three months in the Philippines where I was the interagency coordinator for accountability to effective populations for OCHA. I'm getting ready to go back next week for an aid effectiveness study. And in, in that capacity, I had a lot of opportunities to speak with affected communities about their perceptions of the response. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight some of the things that I heard that I think are interesting to put on the table in addition to your perspectives. And um, I had the opportunity to do listening exercises in Guillan, in Rojas, in Ormoc, Estancia, Tacloban. And three issues that I just wanted to bring up um, to add to the picture. Um, communities very consistently spoke about certainly how grateful they were about the aid for sure. And then when we dug a little bit deeper, they also talked about the how aid was politicized. And so there were issues around municipalities giving aid in a way that favored the barangays, which is the, the villages basically based on their political alignment. And then within the barangays, there was of course also um, sort of a, uh, aid was also affected by um, the, the political perspectives of the, the, the villagers. So that was an issue that came up very, very consistently that they would have um, highlighted around aid effectiveness and them getting aid and the most vulnerable getting aid. A second issue was the issue around livelihoods. It was very interesting because um, I didn't get there till January and I left in mid-April. Um, and from January onwards, when I went out and spoke with communities, they were really clear that they wanted to go beyond cash for work and they wanted to go to meaningful livelihood activities. And it's just worth noting, because I think in our sort of um, chronology of aid, um, you know, immediately, of course, we're doing cash for work and we're doing sort of short-term aid. Um, but they would have been ready for like some long-term livelihood programs like at week two. You know, now we're at month six and I know that's still something that we're struggling to get going and it's very challenging for sure. But it was an issue that very consistently came up. Um, it's obviously an empowering issue. It's an issue that minimizes reliance on outside aid. And also from a mental health perspective, people are saying, you know, it gives us something to do than to sit here and kind of wait for inconsistent aid. So it was really uh, uh, critical and very important for them to start early on. Um, and the third issue that came up was a real need for information about the response. You know, people wanted to know, when are we getting aid? How long? Who's it coming from? What kind of aid? When are we being moved? How long do we stay in temporary housing? Are we getting permanent housing? So just a lot of questions um, around the response and um, just engagement with the community in terms of what they could expect uh, from the response short term and long term. Great, thank you very much. I'm here for my friend Mike Hess. Thanks, Dan. Um, interesting comments on the civil military coordination and obviously with the climate change that's been highlighted, uh, these tragic storms are gonna get even worse and it's gonna require much more military response, I think, due to the severity of these, uh, these tragedies. But what is the military doing in your perspectives? And I know there's no military panel member, but my friend Jim Shear is sitting over there anxiously gnawing at this one. To, to make this not a pickup game, to institutionalize these responses. We've been working on it for a long time. I started, I was six, seven, and had brown hair. Uh, and it's a battle all the time because the military is so large and to train them and keep them ready and focused on this is not their primary mission. But what can we do to make this more effective, quicker, so that we can do the pull versus the push and uh, minimize these disasters that are gonna be coming more and more often? Great, so we got a, a whole suite of issues. I'm gonna ask Jer uh, Jeremy to start. Great. Um, to, just to the initial question on the concept papers, I'm not, I'm not sure which solicitation. I think that's probably being driven by the USAID mission in the Philippines. Uh, in Manila, so I would recommend that that's probably your best point of contact is to try and reach out. I'm sure there's an email address for that that, that 
you can ask some of those those questions too. I'm not I'm not familiar with that specific solicitation. Um, uh, on the the response from affected communities, I'm I'm really glad that has happened, um, and I think that that is, um, and I'm glad you raised those points because I think it's it's very easy to to kind of look at everything that's been achieved and say and kind of pat ourselves on the back and it is really important and, and I'm glad Ocha is doing this to structure into our process those feedback mechanisms to get that feedback on uh, you know to, to check ourselves basically on whether on whether we're doing as well as we might think we're doing um, I think on the um, on the, the point about aid being uh, aid being politicized all um, I might punt that mostly to the government um, I, I think that the um, you know, we, uh, there's, uh, you, you want to have local ownership, um, and when you've got a, a capable government in place, you, you, that's your, that's your principal partner. Um, that does get you into government, governance issues and governance responsiveness issues and so on, and that's kind of unavoidable. And, and, uh, you know, I think we, we face, even in, you know, crises in the United States, we, we face a lot of blowback against local, federal, and, and, and state governments about whether or not they've handled things effectively or not. I think that's a natural part of any response, but I, I, in one level, I, I actually take some encouragement from the fact that of all the things, the whole universe of things that people could be concerned with, that they're focused on that as opposed to, you know, a cholera outbreak or something like that. Like, you know, on the hierarchy of needs, that's that's one that's a better one to be to, that's a, to be getting back than you know folks are you know folks are living out in the open six months into the, the crisis or something like that, um, uh, and um, on the uh, but I think that's a really important exercise and I'd actually love to to make sure that OFDA gets copies of that because I think that's useful to us I'm sure I'm sure you're talking with our, our teams out in the field in any case um, on the, the the military piece Mike um, the yeah, it is. It is a challenge because the military is huge, and and you know we're not small, but we're not like military big. Um, it it is a challenge to to institutionalize that. And you're right. This is going to be happening more and more often. And from my conversations with with the military, um, and I went out and talked with Pacific Command uh, last fall when this was going on on my way out to the Philippines to visit the the response. Um, they're very seized with it. You know, in PACOM, they're very seized with this. They see this as this is going to be a pretty much standing element of their mission in the Pacific on, a, on an ongoing basis. So they, they get that they're going to need to be able to up their game and do this right. And, um, and I, th I think that commitment exists all the way up to Secretary Hagel. Uh, Secretary Hagel, uh, a couple weeks ago, convened the, the ASEAN defense ministers in Hawaii, first time the U.S. has ever hosted that, and, and he made a point of ensuring that there was a, an event um, as part of those, those several days focused on disaster response. And he invited USAID to convene that, so our, our boss, Rajiv Shah, co-convened that with him, um, and they co-led that event. So there is, I think, a strong commitment in the military recognizing this is going to be an important role for them going forward. But what's equally just fantastic about how they're approaching that, um, and this again, a commitment all the way up to Secretary Hagel, is a commitment that that needs to be a civilian-led process. And, and that was really the message that, that we were trying to convey to the ASEAN defense ministers as well, that the most effective model here is civilian leadership backed up by military support. Um, and the, the capacity, the military has a lot of capacities to bring, but they're, they're, they're not, as you say, this is never going to be their primary mission. So on the strategy, on the priority setting, the goal setting, that's not going to be what the military, that's not going to be the military's comparative advantage. So you need that, uh, you need systems for pointing the military in the right direction and using those capacities towards the right ends. And I think we, we've developed some 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 good systems for that. We're still getting better, but I think that the Philippines has been a nice proof of the Philippines response is a nice proof of concept that some of those investments that we and the military have been making in a, a higher level of interoperability are actually paying off. Mary, not sure how many of those those I'll just make I guess one comment. I guess the feedback um, Regardless of what organization, I think the feedback going back to the group or the uh, nonprofit or the companies, the private, um, it helps build the MOP as part of the editing in the post crisis as far as what can be done better next. And that's all I'd say about that. Thank you.
Praveen, do you, I suspect that there's many things you could respond to in, in, in some of the questions I that think, were here. I think, mo I think most of them have been covered. Okay. Uh, I'd be well, I'd welcome a lot of conversation when you're back and talking, but I think this feedback mechanism is extremely important. Um, it's really important that this information get up and, and, and be able to be seen. Um, and um, I think there's lots being done, but a lot more could be yeah. done in ensuring, and it's, 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 an, it's a new area, I must, I, I must admit, it's a new area. Um, maybe all that needs to be done has not been done, and we need to work through this so it becomes part of our mm -hmm. process. I suspect, Maria, that a lot of the uh, questions and comments uh, have, a, have a government component to them, so I think uh, we're all quite interested in, in your take on all this. Very briefly, uh, thank you for your comments. The Philippine government is very much engaged, listening, and we are taking all feedback on board to make sure, as we said, this is not a one-off event. Unfortunately, we are bound to see the same disaster happen, hopefully in a smaller scale, but we are taking all suggestions and inputs that will allow us to respond more constructively in a better way to uh, future events. On the issue of the local government, uh, such issues has always come up, but what I can say is under the reconstruction plan being drafted, the inputs of all local government agencies are being solicited and inputted into the program, which we expect to, to unveil in June. The local governments are in the best position to tell uh, the national government exactly what they need, when they need them, how they need them. So uh, the presidential assistant on reconstruction and recovery has been very mindful of making sure that the inputs of all local governments, regardless of political affiliations, uh, are heard and put on board. On the issue of mill to mill cooperation and how to institutionalize it, uh, there have been very long and productive discussions both on the bilateral and regional level on this, and we have seen this figure more prominently in all discussions between the defense authorities at regional and bilateral level. So we are hopeful that uh, this will become a regular part under the framework of the military being able to preposition both their skills and capabilities in support of civilian operations for disaster relief, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Thank you. Okay, so I, I want to hear from this suite of three folks here. Start with this this woman in the in, in front, and then there's two folks in the back. Microphone, microphone. Thank you, um, Aaron Cochran, uh, World Food Program USA. So I'm going to be a little biased here. Uh, question for Praveen, and then for Larry. Praveen, can you talk a little bit about what you all are doing right now to prepare for the typhoon season coming up? In you know, in light of the fact that obviously you're just getting through high end and continuing that recovery effort. And then, Larry, can you, you've talked a lot about MOP, your master operating plan. Can you talk about some of the feedback that you received so far from the UPS folks that were on the ground during Haiyan and what they learned from the experience and how that's going to change the plan going forward? Hello, I'm Jim Shear, formerly DOD, and provoked by Mike Hess. I would simply add one very small comment there. In terms of looking ahead at DOD or the U.S. military as a disaster responder, let's bear in mind that the formulation that our Philippine colleague used, build back better, that's development assistance. That's not something the DOD can fund. So we have to be very careful about that. 500 lawyers would immediately descend on me in DOD uh, if, with that problem. But here's a specific issue on the NGO and the public-private partnerships. Uh, you're absolutely right that this is not a primary DOD mission. And DOD may disappear if it has a military mission to do halfway through the operation, as we did during Hurricane Mitch response in Central America in 1998. Suddenly there was Desert Fox in Baghdad. We were gone. We needed UPS to haul stuff. So let's bear that in mind. But in, in terms of the larger effort of NGOs in Haiti, as you said, one of the biggest challenges was giving our military air traffic controllers at the Port-au-Prince airport the knowledge of which is the best five or 10 NGOs within the shelter cluster or the food or the health cluster, give them access through very limited allocations of flight slots. That was, I would say, if you could rebuild the cluster in the air traffic control, and especially in staging airports where it, access was hard, if you can do that, that would be uh, very much appreciated, so. Thank you very much. The woman next to you. Oh, 
Thank you so much. My name is Rita Jaron Adkins. I'm a journalist, and uh, this would be in the speculation box. Uh, the Haiyan uh, disaster, as Ban Ki-moon had said, is a wake-up call to the world, and President Obama is sort of now in a role talking about climate change and the uh, disastrous effects, not only here in the United States, but of course, in uh, other parts of the world. My question is that, is this an opportunity for the think tanks, including CSIS, uh, to go beyond the disaster perfecting the, the efficiency of the recovery and the rebuilding processes, eliciting from the federal government, from the government, as well as the NGOs. But is this also an opportunity to sort of move the debate to what the freaking hell is causing all this and what to do about it, such as, for instance, the alternative to uh, the cost for it, which is apparently the carbon footprint, which is causing this disaster, uh, these changes in the environment that, unfortunately, the, the poor developing countries like the Philippines are not in a good position to recover without our help. What I mean by help is so, that. So now, the, the question root, is so that. So the root causes. The, 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 so, right, right. But what to do so just, far just as close, changing. You want right, to close right. up your question. Right. The question is that, is this therefore an opportunity to also have the dialogue move to uh, what are the alternatives to these disastrous mechanisms and goodies that we use, carbon footprint, et cetera, and all that, and help the developing countries to sort of, with our technology, with our savvy, with our research, et cetera, to sort of stimulate what are those other alternatives to this disastrous use of coal-based types okay. of things? Thank, thank and you very will much. Will the United States help okay. the Philippines and the rest of the world? Thank you very much. Okay. That. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Praveen, why don't we first take the World Food Program question, and then I would like to hear various perspectives on Jim's question. Why don't I take a crack at the third question? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, and very quickly. Yes, as we move forward, uh, we've heard from everybody that it's not a question of if, but when. And what do we do? How do we get ready for the next one? Um, what do we need to put into place? Well, we've been in discussion with the, with the government of the Philippines. Uh, sorry. With, with the government of the Philippines in looking at what we're calling a three-hub concept, looking at the entire country and saying, what do we need to pre-position, place, uh, um, and we're looking at one in Subic Bay, we're looking one in Cebu, and we're looking one in Davao to have some pre-existing capacity and knowledge. Um, in, in, Haya, in, in Yolanda, we were moving food packages from Manila. Tacloban is more than an hour's flight with no railroads and no uh, sea transport available and no land transport available. And of course, air transport being just telling very limited. What, what's a row row? Just make sure <laughs> not row row your boat, of course, but just well, explain is, what a row it row is. Actually, is. It is actually a boat, but it's what we call roll on and roll off. Right. Um, a transport vehicle uh, for 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 sea. Um, so it is creating that capacity uh, and installing that capacity uh, within the country. But more importantly, than just a physical stock, and you know, putting food or non-food and pre-positioning and all that is really creating a, a, a capacity building um, and, and training people and using these as situation rooms, as training areas, where the first point of call is, as I believe uh, Jeremy was saying, it's the community. How do they respond? So getting the communities, the, the municipal authorities, the provincial authorities, which should be the first point of call. Um, really engaged and, and knowing what needs to be done. So we're, we're, as we're moving forward, we're doing that on the one front in terms of preparedness. But in, in the other, in, the, in, in, in terms of Yolanda specific, um, is working with our other UN colleagues and, and partners in, in laying the foundation for early recovery and livelihood so that that can be built upon and, and, and move forward. Larry, I'm just thinking about you, you. There was this earlier comment and discussion about feedback loops and learning. You have a multi-company uh, partnership of, of LETS and so L, the, of the LET, and you had a group of them deployed to the Philippines. How does that learning come back, and how does that group prepare? And, and talk a little bit about that. And, and how was this? Is this a group housed out of? The, is this a group that came together through some, through the World Economic Forum. How did you all, how, just first talk a little bit, how did you all come together? What did you take away from 
the Philippines, and how does that feed into your preparations? Okay, I start off with it came, came together through the UN and the request for logistics support, uh, the logistics cluster. Um, as I mentioned before, four competitors actually working together for a common goal, uh, which doesn't happen often. Um, second of all, um, how the information comes back. The teams actually formally report back um, improvements. So a couple uh, points to Aaron to your questions. Um, what, what's some of the feedback and what would we do differently? Um, experience um, was heavily weighted. Uh, I, I actually spoke to our team members. Um, having trained people, because as you've heard and you've seen before, there's a lot of people who want to do good, who volunteer and provide uh, relief. However, they need trained or organized and steered in the right direction, and that's where you need the experienced staff. Um, and as I said, the um, LETs are trained uh, in advance, and obviously those that are trained specifically in this type of relief or in these geographical areas provide even greater value. Uh, the second point they made was the importance of local staff. Uh, local staff that, of course, speak the language, understand the culture, um, and in our case, um, our, in our case, one of our managers who actually uh, was an expert in customs clearance, as I mentioned, um, helped other organizations clear clear their products based off of new changes um, through brokerage requirements. So having someone with that local knowledge and the ability to clear product faster than they would have without having that knowledge helps get the product to the um, end game or, or to the receivers. Um, the third point would be the preparedness. And um, we have worked with the WFP um, in several different areas, Rwanda, Dominican Republic, um, Syria, doing preparedness assessments and, and determining what the transportation capabilities are of those areas so that when a crisis strikes that you can actually move relief. You know how to based off of um, capabilities, whether it's a port, or an airline, um, whether it's a truck. Um, also, simple things such as the equipment that you provide for relief, that there's clearance based off the bridges in that country, or what the maximum tonnage is on a road. So um, my point is the preparedness assessment um, would provide value to these emerging markets in areas of high risk, and preparing that is part of the MOP. Um, the last point they made was um, these kinks in the supply chain and, and try to identify what those are, whether it's customs clearance or whether it's unsolicited relief product being sent. Um, one example was um, these huge gallon, um, I want to say 100 gallons jugs of water, but a way to containerize it to get it to individuals. So it was a good intent but uh, wasn't really good to go through the supply chain to distribute. So um, preventing the kinks and eliminating the, cl the clogs that can occur in a supply chain. Jeremy, I'm, I'm hoping you and Maria can take this question of the civ mill relationship. It might, might, might start with you and then Maria, spe the specifics of the Philippine mm -hmm. case in particular. But yeah, yeah um, and uh, I... Jim, I take your I very much take your point about the Build Back Better, um, I, and I don't think we're you know we're, we're not looking to the military for for that. Um, but you know, what the military has are these amazing logistics capabilities and the ability to scale up extremely extremely fast. And um, the I think that the, the example you raised of the the airport in Haiti and the air traffic control challenges there is a nice again it's a nice contrast with where we've gone in the in the several years since then. Because we faced a pretty similar challenge in the early days in the Philippines. We had, you know, Tacloban was the worst hit area. Uh, it was the epicenter of the crisis. It was really the major city uh, in that entire area. And the port was heavily damaged and the airport was heavily damaged. And so the ability to get things in for those first couple weeks was very, very constrained. I mean, we were pushing an orange through a straw. And um, the, the U.S. military came in and... Um, had the same set of questions. What do we prioritize? We have we have four or five C-130s that we can land down there every day. What do we put on those things? 
Um, the UN wants, you know, the US has its own stuff, stuff from OFDA stocks that are going on, a couple of them, but the UN wants to put things on, there are NGOs who want to put. What, the difference in Haiti is we have a system for that now, much better than we had then. Um, and we have the bodies to actually staff it. So um, in Haiti, we, we were way outmatched. The, the military had a lot more people but, and a lot more units, and we didn't have the bodies to keep up with them. And uh, we have um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the really positive things to come out of the QDDR for USAID was an authorization to, uh, to my office to staff up further in recognition of that, of that reality. Um, so we have really staffed up our military advisory capacity such that we have a, now a surge core globally that we can pull people forward from when this sort of a thing strikes. And so as the military ramped up its engagement, we just kept pulling people forward. They sent an aircraft carrier, we pulled someone, put them on the aircraft carrier. They set up at the airport, we pulled someone put them at the airport so that we could stay stepped with the military engagement and keep them pointed in the right direction and play that advisory role so that they weren't saying, geez, do we put MSF stuff on or Oxfam stuff or this NGO we've never heard? We could actually do that, and that worked really well. Thank you. I would have to agree with Cherry Me that uh, in the case of the Philippines, the military and the civilians really played complementary roles. In our case, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Agency is our lead agency in cases like this, and it's civilian-led. But normally, we would have to go to the backbone of the military to do things that in the height of the disaster, no civilian can. Like, we were not, we had practically no runways. So the help, the military bringing in this magnificent helicopter, this magnificent planes that did not have to that have that did not need a runway were really lifesavers, especially in bringing a relief products to the smaller islands. But again, this was all done under the direction of civilian authorities and NGOs. So uh, the military played an excellent, very big support role to the civilian effort that was going on. I want to um, just. I'm going to wrap up the, the conversation here and just say that there was a terrible tragedy six months ago, but I think as you've listened to this conversation, there's a lot of hope, uh, and the response, I think, is was really an a exemplary response of the various sectors, and I think there's a lot of lessons to be taken here, and I want to thank the panel, and please join me in thanking the panel.